Hey, Retcon Raider here. Well, here we are. It's taken 30 months and 79 videos, but it's finally time to talk about Phoenix Point. Right off the bat, let me just start by saying that there's way too much for us to actually cover in what's supposed to be a short overview. If you really want a more granular look at the individual mechanics, then I'd recommend checking out the actual tutorial videos over on the official Phoenix Point YouTube channel. Or you could check out my uh, own gameplay series, if you'd like. I'm certainly not going to twist your arm. That said, what is Phoenix Point? Well, assuming you haven't watched any of my other videos, Phoenix Point is basically a turn-based tactical strategy game, with a focus on both global strategy and squad-level turn-based tactics. It's the latest entry in the small but rapidly growing subgenre of XCOM likes, a genre specifically inspired by the original XCOM game, UFO Defense. That was a game designed by Nick and Julian Golub all the way back in 1994, but which was revitalized much more recently with the release of XCOM Enemy Unknown, a complete reimagining designed by Jake Solomon and Firaxis released in 2012. Now, individual opinions are sure to vary, but those two games were obviously very different, and I'm not just talking about things like graphics or technical limitations. Rather, the original game was designed to be a harsh simulation, requiring in-depth micromanagement both on and off the battlefield. Soldiers were frail but numerous, and a single battle could take hours to complete. Casualties were inevitable, but with luck and perseverance, the player could overcome the alien invasion. You know, eventually. In comparison, Enemy Unknown presented the player with a much more cinematic and streamlined experience. Squads were smaller, and individual soldiers were much more powerful and a lot of the micromanagement was essentially trimmed out, especially on the global strategy layer. While this did make the game much more simple overall, it also made it much more accessible, and made for an overall quick and more gratifying experience. Which, of course, brings us to Phoenix Point, a game designed by Julian Gala, but also a project supported by Jake Solomon, who became one of the game's biggest and most notable investors. It's a game that tries to strike a balance between the old and the new, providing more granularity than Enemy Unknown, but without drowning the player in micromanagement. This is evident in almost every single aspect of the game, including both the Geoscape-based strategy layer, as well as the turn-based tactical layer, it's a little more forgiving than the original XCOM trilogy, but a lot more punishing than the newer installments. It's also a game which draws inspiration from beyond the original franchise, most notably by incorporating elements of diplomacy, exploration, and a much stronger narrative. Similar to XCOM, Phoenix Point explores a world that's essentially under siege by an unknown alien invasion. Unlike XCOM, however, this is actually some sort of viral invasion that's been taking place since prehistoric times. The invasion originally targeted a completely different prehistoric civilization that long predated the human race. Now, there's roughly 500 pages of official fiction exploring the elaborate and well-written backstory of Phoenix Point, so I won't really go into it here. Suffice to say, after literal millennia spent recovering in the deepest depths of our oceans, the alien virus has finally recovered, and it's once again set its sights on consuming the planet. The only thing standing in its way is the Phoenix Project, an international organization specifically founded to help protect the planet from extraterrestrial threats. Unfortunately, by the time the invasion actually takes place, the project has been all but shut down, essentially crippled by a combination of red tape and political sabotage. 
To make things even worse, the enemy has learned from its previous defeat, and this time it spent much of its long recovery slowly stacking the odds in its favor. This tosses the player into a rather bleak situation, in control of an organization that no longer exists, in a world where humanity is already on the brink of extinction. Equipped with little more than a half-built base, a handful of soldiers, and a meager amount of resources, the player is tasked with rebuilding the Phoenix Project from the ground up, and hopefully finding some way to stop the alien virus in the process. They can do this by scouring the planet for whatever's left of the original project, or they can instead turn to one of the three new factions that have risen to power in the wake of the apocalypse. Of course, this will almost certainly end up drawing the ire of at least one of the other factions, because while all three factions share the common goal of saving humanity, their methodologies are essentially diametrically opposed. On the other hand, the player can also shun such alliances, instead striking out on their own. It's always possible that the tattered remnants of the Phoenix Project might actually offer a solution of its own. In that case, the player will have to do things the hard way, trading or even raiding the other factions for the resources and technology that they need. Again, this will almost certainly end up drawing the wrath of one or more factions, but at least the player will be in complete control of their own destiny. For better or worse, the entire fate of the planet will now rest squarely in their trembling, blood-soaked hands. Regardless of which approach the player decides to take, they'll do it by exploring the world around them, discovering things like scavenging sites, friendly havens, and even stranger things. They'll start off with a single base, the titular Phoenix Point, but over time they'll also discover other abandoned Phoenix Project facilities, which they can then restore to effectively expand their area of influence. They'll even encounter special narrative events, which will often prompt the players to make some sort of decision. This can be something as simple as deciding to agree or disagree with one of the other factions, but it can also include decisions that may end up risking the lives of the soldiers under the player's command. Of course, it's important to remember that the player is not operating in a vacuum. Over time, the other three factions will continue pursuing their own projects as well, researching new technology, defending their havens, and fighting back against the aliens— and eventually, they might even end up declaring war against each other. Similarly, the aliens will not sit idly by while the player is rebuilding the project. Over time, the viral mist will slowly spread further and further inland, starting with lower elevations, but eventually rising to higher elevations as well. Wherever this mist goes, viral mutants are sure to follow, and eventually the aliens will even begin building their own bases as well. These hideous monsters will scour the surrounding regions for targets of opportunity, laying siege to any nearby havens. Or even a Phoenix Project base, if there happens to be one close enough. To make things even worse, every haven that falls will not only make the aliens stronger, but it will also add to the Oniric Delirium Index essentially the Phoenix Point equivalent of the Doomsday Clock. As the game progresses, more and more havens will fall, and the aliens will grow increasingly powerful, until, eventually, there simply won't be any humanity left to protect. The campaign will come to an unfortunate end, and the player will just have to move a little quicker the next time around. Fortunately, there are ways to slow or even temporarily stop the viral advance. The easiest way to do this is by defending havens or bases that come under attack. If the attacking mutants are successfully repelled, the player will be able to track them back to the nest that they came from. Destroying these nests will stall the alien agenda and net the player some valuable resources and reputation in the process. 
Of course, ultimately, push will come to shove, and uh, that's where the tactical layer of the game takes over. Whenever the player chooses to loot a scavenging site, defend a friendly haven, or raid an alien base, the game will shift over to a turn-based tactical battle map with procedurally generated scenery and multiple levels of elevation. On the surface, the combat system in Phoenix Point resembles the system used in titles like Enemy Unknown or XCOM 2 from Firaxis. But in actuality, the mechanics working behind the scenes are actually much closer to the ones used in the original trilogy. For example, the game makes use of a time unit system very similar to the one used in the original UFO defense, allowing the player to take actions in whatever order they please, as long as they have enough time units left to actually do so. Attacks are resolved using simulated ballistic trajectories, similar to the way it was handled in games like both UFO Defense and Jagged Alliance. That means that rather than simply rolling a die to determine if you hit or missed, the game instead looks at where you're aiming and essentially traces the bullet from its point of origin to where you're trying to shoot, with a little randomized bullet spread added, just to help keep things interesting. There are no abstract hit chances or defense bonuses to speak of. Instead, Phoenix Point relies almost exclusively on a what-you-see-is-what-you-get sort of mentality. In fact, thanks to the game's free aim system, you don't even have to end up aiming at an enemy. Every shot you fire will end up hitting something, it just might not be what you were originally aiming for. You might hit an obstacle or cover object between you and your intended target, or maybe you'll hit something behind your intended target. A wall, an exploding barrel, possibly even another nearby enemy. Or perhaps even one of your own squad mates. Like I said, every bullet has to go somewhere, so it's always important to make sure your line of fire is clear before you decide to actually pull the trigger. This plays hand-in-hand hand with both the destructible terrain system as well as the hit location system. Hitting an obstacle, for example, may end up destroying it, or even causing it to explode if it happened to be something combustible. If your projectile is powerful enough, then it might even end up passing right through that obstacle, allowing you to theoretically shoot targets on the other side of walls, or even punch a bullet straight through multiple targets standing in a row. Once you do actually end up hitting a target, the exact location struck can also make a significant difference. Similar to games like Fallout, almost every unit in Phoenix Point is made up of multiple body locations. Arms, legs, head and torso, and sometimes even stranger things. Each of those locations has its own separate function, as well as its own armor rating and individual hit point threshold. Inflicting enough damage on a single target location will effectively cripple it, applying an assortment of related negative effects, such as profuse bleeding, stat penalties, or even completely disabling that unit's ability to attack or use certain special abilities. Again, this is something that actually plays into yet another one of Phoenix Point's rather intriguing new mechanics. In this case, the Modular Mutation System. While there are only about a dozen different types of mutants in the game, many of those mutants have multiple options for each of their major body parts. Different alien bases will experiment with different combinations of parts, sometimes influenced by how well or how poorly those mutants are performing in battle. Thankfully, the player also has access to a wide assortment of tricks to help level the playing field. While they'll only start with some very basic equipment, they'll eventually be able to manufacture or maybe just steal much more powerful armor and weaponry. A lot of this can be unlocked using the game's fairly extensive research system, which includes both a basic research tree for the Phoenix Project, which largely focuses on finding new ways to counter the aliens, but also three specialized research trees, representing the three rival factions. 
For example, New Jericho holds dominion over a particularly potent weaponry, such as Gauss rifles and heavy explosives. The Disciples hold the secrets of potent combat mutations, as well as powerful biological weapons, while Sinedrion controls the secrets of energy weapons and other particularly advanced technology. A player can acquire most of this research through diplomacy or through violence. If they can somehow get their hands on copies of a certain faction's weapons or armor, then they can also just reverse-engineer them, allowing them to acquire at least some of the faction-exclusive tech without making powerful enemies in the process. In addition, the player soldiers will also grow more powerful over time. Every time a soldier survives a battle, they'll gain experience points, and every time they gain enough experience to gain a level, they'll gain 50 ability points. Each soldier will also have access to a small assortment of semi-randomized passive traits, representing that particular soldier's special talents and natural affinities. Initially, the player will only have access to the three basic classes, Assault Soldiers, Heavy Soldiers, and Snipers. Each of these classes comes with its own set of special abilities, as well as their own set of proficiencies, showing which equipment they're best suited to use. While they can still use equipment that they're not actually proficient with, they'll do so with slight penalties, usually represented by a chance to fumble when using it, or just a decreased accuracy when firing at distant targets. Over time, the player will also gain access to additional faction-based elite classes, such as Sinedrion Stealthy Infiltrator or the Disciple's Mind-Controlling Priest. These elite classes can be recruited directly from appropriate havens, but the player can also acquire research that will allow them to train these classes themselves. What's more, the player can even mix and match these classes using the game's dual classing system. When a soldier is first recruited, he'll only have a single class, but once he reaches level 4, the player will have the option to stack a second class on top of his first one. This will basically double the amount of abilities he has access to, as well as the types of equipment that he's trained to use. For example, an assault soldier dual-classed into technician can become a highly mobile combat medic, capable of both reaching and treating injured allies in a fraction of the time it would take any other character class to accomplish. A berserker dual-classed with a heavy, on the other hand, can become a paragon of destruction, capable of both shrugging off most attacks, while also unleashing an unparalleled barrage of adrenaline-fueled destruction as they fire off up to four heavy attacks in a single round. Of course, while powerful, it is important to note that these abilities are inherently limited, both by the soldier's limited number of ability points, as well as their willpower attribute. Willpower provides the player with will points, which is essentially the currency they need to spend to fuel those special abilities on the battlefield. It also represents a soldier's current state of mind, and negative events such as losing an ally or suffering a crippling wound can further sap a soldier's will. Running out of will points in the middle of a fight doesn't just mean that the character can't use their abilities. If their current number of will points ever dips below zero, then they'll actually end up panicking, automatically running for cover and skipping their next turn. Even worse, will points are used to actively resist certain enemy attacks, most notably ones intended to influence or even outright control a soldier's mind. There are only a few ways to recover will points out on the battlefield, such as by skipping your turn to recover, or by successfully capturing an objective or killing a dangerous enemy. If the player becomes overly reliant on using their various special abilities, then they might find themselves paying the price. There's nothing worse than losing control of your most powerful soldiers in the middle of an already difficult fight, even if it is just for a single turn. Anyway, there's a lot more we could talk about, but I think you get the idea. The game actually includes numerous notable mechanics, 
including things like perception and stealth, drivable vehicles, customizable bases and soldiers, mid-battle looting, and the ability to mutate your own soldiers into hideous abominations. But if we try to touch on everything, then we'll be here for hours. Again, if you really want to hear all the gritty details, then your best bet is to check out those official tutorial videos. Or follow my own series, where I'll spend a lot more time talking about those individual mechanics. For now, suffice to say that the game offers a fairly impressive amount of content, especially considering the rather limited time and budget that the developers had to work with. I was pleasantly surprised to find that the launch version had fully voiced cutscenes, as well as an assortment of fully voiced story events. The research system has been extensively reworked with pretty new pictures and more immersive text, and the Phoenixpedia is finally enabled, providing the player with access to a full list of in-game tutorials, as well as a collection of all the research, equipment, and lore that they've collected through their current campaign. Oh, and if I haven't already said it, it's also worth mentioning that the game has been extensively rebalanced since Backer Build 5. Although there are still a few exploits that seem to have slipped through the cracks, the game is by and large far more brutal than it used to be. If the player lets the aliens grow too quickly, then they'll eventually find themselves faced with opponents who can viciously slaughter their strongest soldiers with just one or two attacks. It's important to remember that not every battle is meant to be won, and sometimes you're better off knowing when to just cut and run, even if it does mean having to leave one of your own soldiers behind. Of course, it's ultimately up to the player to decide exactly how they'll treat their soldiers. Valuable assets to be protected at any cost, or just more meat for the grinder. The game even accommodates players who simply refuse to concede defeat, supporting mid-battle saves and even providing an option to replay a battle if you don't like how it's turning out. For players who prefer to resist that sort of temptation, there's also an in-game Iron Man mode, which will essentially force them to live with the consequences of their terrible decisions. So, with all that in mind, would I personally suggest buying Phoenix Point? Well, let's go with a qualified yes. I mean, obviously I'm pretty invested in the project. Not only am I an original backer, but I also basically started a YouTube channel just so I could talk about it. I like to consider myself to be uh, pretty open-minded to both the good and the bad, but there's certainly a chance that I might be a little biased. That said, I will say that while I'm more or less happy with the launch version of the game, especially given the unexpected upgrades such as the voiced cutscenes, the expanded lore, and the much more brutal difficulty curve, I'll also say that I'm a little disappointed by all the things that didn't end up making it into the game. It's a little painful to see so many of the game's more granular elements or proposed concepts getting discarded throughout the development process. This includes things like the game's original body horror motif, as well as the post-apocalyptic style invoked by a lot of the early concept art, but it also includes more concrete elements, such as things like specialty ammunition, cybernetics, weapon mods, or even the in-depth injury and mental trauma mechanic. There are even some fairly recent concepts teased by the developers that are nowhere to be found in the launch version of the game. This includes things like the Synedrion drones, friendly defenders during Haven defense missions, and at least a couple of different types of unique new mutants, such as the city-destroying behemoth or the totally tubular juggernaut. For what it's worth, though, at least some of that unfinished content will still be making an appearance in the future. Snapshot Games has committed to at least one full year worth of post-launch support, including both free content updates, as well as a variety of pretty reasonably priced DLC. They've even promised to add mod support, which would open the floodgates to a huge variety of user-made content 
We just don't actually have a solid timeline for most of that stuff. Not yet, anyway. So, while I would in fact say that the current game is well worth purchasing, I would also suggest doing a little research before you actually decide to buy it. The game is already pretty solid, and it only promises to get better over time. The real question is whether you want to play the fairly basic version of the game now, or a much more complete version of the game later, once all that extra content has finally been implemented. As for me, well, you already know my vote. If you're a fan of the XCOM franchise, whether the new or the old, then I certainly think Phoenix Point is well worth your time. But, then again, you certainly don't have to take my word for it. As always, if Phoenix Point looks like the sort of game that you might enjoy, then I strongly encourage you to go check it out for yourself. You can find out more about Phoenix Point by visiting the official website, the official YouTube channel, the official Discord server, the official Facebook page, the official Twitter feed, or the original crowdfunding campaign over on FIG. As always, links are in the description.